Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's program entitled Cisco Support Community Expert Series, Cable Modem Termination Systems Architecture Configuration and Troubleshooting. We're glad that you've been able to join us. A few housekeeping notes to begin. As you entered the WebEx console, you either joined us by audio broadcast or by phone, which is automatically muted. Because of our large audience in attendance today, you will remain muted throughout the event. When you have a question, please feel free to enter that into the WebEx Q&A panel as you think of them. You can find it on the right-hand side of the console. Please leave the WebEx chat window for communication to our WebEx facilitators for any problems or technical issues you may be experiencing. Please again remember to ask your questions in the Q&A panel at any point. This session is being recorded and you will receive an email containing a link to the recorded session. We would appreciate your input regarding today's webcast through a short survey that will pop up when you close your browser at the end. At this time, I would like to introduce our moderator, Dan Gerson. Dan, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Welcome everyone to the Cisco Support Community. Today we will present a live Cisco Support Community Expert Series webcast. Our topic today is Cable Modem Termination Systems Architecture Configuration and Troubleshooting. My name is Dan Gerson and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Our expert joining me today is Eric Batista. Eric is a customer support engineer in the Cisco TAC. He is responsible for supporting the Cisco UBR CMTS platforms. He has three and a half years of experience in cable technology, and in his uh, previous uh, in his previous role, uh, Eric supported Cisco WAN and optical technologies, including QoS and Sonnet SDH. Welcome, Eric. Our expert panelists today are John Body and Jason Garrett. They will help in answering some of your technical questions during today's event. Now I'd like to briefly outline the format for our expert event today. Eric will start with a presentation on cable modem termination systems for the first hour of the program, and then, and then we will provide an answer to the question, what cable or video milestone is celebrating its 10th anniversary at Cisco? So stay tuned for that. After that, we'll dive into the live question submission for the audience for the remaining 30 minutes of the event. During our live presentation, you may submit your technical questions to be answered by our presenter and the expert panelists using the Q&A box on the right side of your console. The team of experts is well versed in cable modem termination systems, so please begin your posting your questions now or at any time during the event to give us the best chance of answering them. If you experience any technical issues, please post those questions into the chat. We'll be, asking, we'll be asking polling questions today during the webcast, and we do encourage you to participate by answering them. Also, if you'd like a copy of today's presentation, you can download the PDF using the link in the chat window. Also, as an extra bonus today, everyone who joins today's webcast will be receiving 125 Cisco Preferred Access Points, and you will receive an email regarding those in the week following the webcast. Now, let's get started with today's event. We'll start it off with a polling question. What experience do you have with the Cisco CMTS platform? Is it A, basic configuration and troubleshooting? B, expert level configuration and troubleshooting? C, I work on adjacent devices? Or D, none? Please take a moment to answer so that Eric can configure his presentation to the audience needs. Don't forget, you can submit your questions at any time, and we will be collecting those for, for uh, the answers later on after the presentation. Okay, I'm going to hand the mic over to Eric so he can begin his presentation. Eric? Thanks, Dan, and good morning, everyone. Uh, just, this is Eric, and I want to thank you all for attending this webcast. Um, as you may know, this is one of the first webcasts that we're offering in the service provider or video community, so uh, it's really good. Looks like we have a good-sized audience, and again, we're excited to kick off this new uh, space in the community. Uh, let's see if we have the uh, po results to the polling questions coming in here. OK, 
Okay, we'll give you guys some more time to answer that, but let me go ahead and start with the agenda of the course for today. Um, basically, given basic information and show commands from a Cisco CMTS, the learner will be able to identify what platform and modules are being used, and they will also be able to describe the HFC topology and describe the current state of their cable interfaces. Um, this is more of a high-level introductory class and we, as part of the kickoff, and we do look forward to having more advanced webcasts in the future. But for today, we'll start off with just the overview of the CMTS and what platforms are, are available with Cisco. Uh, we'll give you a difference of iCMTS versus MCMTS, also known as integrated versus modular. We'll go through the various modules and line cards available for each of the platforms. And finally, we'll go with the, uh, we'll, we'll demonstrate some configuration and show commands or troubleshooting steps. And it looks like the poll results are coming in. Most of the folks are, have basic knowledge of the CMTS. We have quite a few experts, and I did recognize some names in, there, in the participants, so I know uh, you guys are very skilled with CM Cisco CMTS. And there's also some people that uh, don't have any experience. So I think we'll have a, this should be a good class for most people. Um, for the experts, uh, it'll be more of a review than anything. Hopefully, you're still able to pick up some good info there. But um, just again, this is going to be a, a more of a high level in introduction to the CMTS platform. The role of a CMTS. Okay, first of all, the CMTS stands for the Cable Modem Termination System. Um, it's what our service providers use to kind of bridge the RF interfaces with their core network or their IP, their IP side of their um, offerings. There. Let me forward one slide to a, a picture, and uh, you can kind of see a little bit more what we're talking about. So on the right side, what we have there noted by the CM, those are cable modems. Um, they could be residential cable modems at um, at a subscriber's home, or they could be business customers. All those cable modems then aggregate to the CMTS. Let's see if I can get the pointer here. And it's going to take um, that data to and from and um, get, either get you access to the Internet or get you access to some video service offerings from the service provider. Another thing you'll note here is DOCSIS. Which, which is bracketed between the CMTS and the cable modems. And what that is, it is the data over cable service interface specifications. This is the, these are the specs that define, um, I guess, the requirements for both the subscriber locations at the cable modem side and at the CMTS. These specs are managed by um, cable labs who govern all of them and um, Actually, I would encourage you to review the Cable Lab specs. They're um, pretty reasonable or readable. It's a very good document and um, definitely a good reference if you are starting to work on DOCSIS. Okay, I'm going to kind of stay here on this diagram and explain maybe some more of the functions performed by a CMTS. When we look at the connection here between the service provider and the CMTS, what we're talking about there is mostly uh, like a gigabit, interf gigabit Ethernet interfaces um, compared to over here, which would be the more radio frequency or RF interf interfaces. Another important term that you will be um, hearing a lot when, when you start working on CMTS or DOCSIS is a term called MAC domain. And what that means is um, a MAC domain defines a set of downstream and upstream channels that establish two-way communication between the cable modem and CMTS. So perhaps some of you, some of the people in the audience have worked on Cisco routers and switches before, more of our legacy products. When we talk about downstream and upstream in the cable world, that's, that's pretty much the same thing as transmit and receive. So um, from the CMTS perspective, downstream is from the CMTS towards the cable modem, and upstream is from the cable modem towards the CMTS. Let 
and that's pretty much what I described here on this slide. Um, next slide is why is it important to describe how a CMTS is set up? Um, a lot of the, I guess a lot of the legwork when you're working on a CMTS or troubleshooting is really, um, a lot of it is based on the physical connectivity or how your plant is set up. So that's really important to get that um, fundamentally down. If you're troubleshooting an issue, um, you want to make sure that is solid before moving on to maybe some type of higher level or higher layer troubleshooting. Um, if all is bad at the lower levels, at the physical or network layer, then you might be kind of just spinning your wheels troubleshooting um, a, like a layer three problem. Um, so that's kind of the first bullet point there, better isolating what is causing the issue. Um, should you open a case with TAC, um, it, it's definitely very helpful if you can identify the platform, what type of line card, and um, how your MAC domains are set up, just so we can go ahead and get that foundation that I was talking about. Um, like I said, I've been doing cable for about three and a half years now, and it, before that, it, there was a pretty limited, it was very traditional type of cable setups, but in the three and a half years, it really has expanded in the amount of features, um, types of line cards, and port density, and just the, the amount of upstreams and downstreams that are available um, coming out of the CMTS. And last, um, it's, it's always good. Um, we're now entering kind of a, a time where a lot of our products are solutions-based. So end-to-end, -end, you know, you might do a video stream from your uh, DNCS or video source all the way down to the subscriber at their home. So uh, the more you know about the CMTS part of it, maybe it kind of can broaden your scope and you can help, again, isolate the issue. Or if you're trying to set something up in your lab, maybe you, you don't need to ask so much help from different teams. You can kind of put the pieces together on your own. Integrated CMTS versus modular CMTS. This is kind of along the lines of how I said the cable world kind of is developing a lot more types of uh, ways to deliver the data or video content through the CMTS. And we will see the difference here. Uh, you may have seen these before. Basically, the difference is in integrated CMTS, let's see the picture here. The downstream channel, and these are specific terms for downstream, downstream channels are directly modulated and transmitted by a downstream RF port. And that RF port is in, internal to the CMTS. So it might be on a line card, and it's, it's going to go ahead and send out via RF. You can see bracketed here, RF is communication between the CMTS and the cable modem. And it will go ahead and transmit downstream to the cable modem RF straight away. MCS, MCMTS, on the other hand, um, introduces a, an external device to the CMTS, and we call that an edge qualm. And what that does is it, um, instead of RF coming straight out of the CMTS, we have a gig, over gigabit Ethernet medium. We have what they call DEPI um, protocol, and that will transmit DEPI signals from the CMTS to the edge qualm. And the role of the edge com is to then take those DEPI um, parameters, configure it to the appropriate RFs, and then finally out to the cable modem. The cable modem is always going to receive RF transmit and receive, or downstream and upstream. So um, if you do make the conversion from the CMTS to the edge com, you need to eventually come out as a RF signal. Um, you might be asking, what? so what are the benefits or drawbacks to using one over the other. Um, if we'll stay on this picture, you can see that MCMTS, it does introduce a, another device. So that could, you know, there's more management, maybe more costs. Um, it can, um, it, just another device to kind of learn about or configure or troubleshoot. And as and one thing I did not pictured here, but if you do use the MCMTS 
configuration, you'll need a time server to sync up timing between the CMTS and the edge qualm. Um, benefits of MCMTS over ICMTS. Um, ICMTS is simpler, but when you do MCMTS, uh, it gives you a little bit more port density uh, because you don't have to have all these physical ECH connectors coming out of a line card. You could do a, a simple fiber or copper gigi connection to the edge qualm, and then the edge qualm itself will have all of the um, physical RF connectors on that end. Okay, so kind of talked about some of the basic terms and whatnot. Let's go ahead and review some of the uh, products or Cisco offerings in the CMTS platform. First of all, we have the Cisco UBR7225. Uh, this is uh, what we kind of call it the pizza box because it's only two rack units. It can, it's kind of limited and hard set to up to 16 upstream and 16 downstream ports. And it's, it's definitely for your smaller markets out there. Um, if your markets are growing, or in a larger market, you would consider a UBR7246 VXR, a little bit higher performance, and it gives you a little, in a six rack unit form factor, it'll give you up to 32 upstream and 32 downstream ports, depending on what line cards you have installed. The UBR10K is pretty much Cisco's flagship of CMTS platforms, it has the highest performance and port capacity up to 480 upstream and 576 downstreams. And um, it also offers redundancy with respect to line cards and the processors. Here's a picture of the UBR7225. Um, what you'll notice here is just by looking at the picture, I can tell that on the top card here, it is a 16 MC16 line card where it has one downstream RF connector here and six upstream connectors here. So, and that is going to be a single MAC domain consisting of one downstream and six upstreams. On the bottom, uh, just by looking at it, you can tell that it is an MC28 card providing two downstreams on the far right, and eight total upstreams. However, four upstreams are um, paired up with one downstream, and that is kind of the general uh, rule of thumb that that we have: one downstream or four upstreams per one downstream. That's the general guideline. Uh, this is a little bit more details on the platform, but what I do want to highlight are the line cards that are available. Um, as we saw, the 16U, the 28U, those were both on the previous diagram. And then the latest card is the MC88V, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but another convention when, when you're looking at line cards from Cisco, when we say 16U, the first number denotes the available upstreams, and the second number will denote the available downstreams. So 16U, one upstream, six down, um, 28, two up, eight down. Likewise, 88 is eight up, eight down. Uh, processing engines are another important component of each CMTS. For the 7225, we, the MPE G1 and G2 are available. Um, Basically, what the processor does, it manages all your your normal routing protocol updates, any tables, caches, as well as any interface or environmental stats. So when you log into a CMTS, you're really logging into this processor that manages the whole platform. It also does SNMP and any accounting or switching of data traffic. When you upgrade, for example, from G1 to G2, Mostly what you're doing is um, is getting more performance, but a lot of the times with our newer line cards, they require the newer processors as well. So you need to keep an eye out. Um, if you're going to upgrade to one of our later line cards, 
uh, check what requirements are there for the processor. Um, just a little bit more description on each one. Um, and when we said earlier on the 28U card how two by eight, two upstreams and eight down, or two downstreams and eight upstreams, and but they were paired for one downstream for four upstreams, and that pairing is is what uh, we're talking about again with the MAC domain. So those upstreams and downstreams, you know, you can't span across MAC domains when you're talking between the cable modem and the CMTS. When we move to the eight by eight cards, a uh, little it's less restricted on the MAC domains, so you don't necessarily have to limit yourself to one down per four up. You can actually fine tune it as needed uh, based on your bandwidth requirements or um, how many modems you have out in the field. Moving on to the 7246 VXR. Um, this is very similar to the 7225, it just has more uh, slots for line cards, but it does use the same processors and the, pretty much the same line cards as the 7225. Older versions, you'll note here on the fourth bullet point are the MPE 225, which is much older, is supported in this platform. Actually, the MPE 400 is also which were not, MP400 and 225 were not supported on the previous uh, 7225 chassis. If you look on our data sheets online, you'll probably see a lot of these pictures and uh, definitely very helpful. Um, you can see how the line cards are laid out, where your processors, fan trays are, and as well as your power supplies. Uh, since the 7246 was an older platform, um, it does have some older line cards that rarely see in the field, but they are still out there, so I want to let you know about them. And those are the 16U, or I'm sorry, the 16X and the 28X. What the, what the X means is you will need an external up converter. Um, when these line cards send out the frequency, it sends out what they call an IF, or intermediate frequency. So in order to get your um, desired frequency, like for example 609 megahertz or 615, you'll need an external up converter that will take that intermediate frequency and um, tune it as needed. I notice a typo here, this should be eight downstream ports and eight upstream ports. So the UBR10K, um, this is for definitely our larger customers with bigger markets. Um, it has the most port capacity, upstream and downstream. It has, also has the most processing power. And um, I guess another main benefit is the redundancy that I was speaking about earlier. Let's start off with the front side here. These are our PREs, modules or the processors needed to operate the UBR10K. And as you can see, there are two of them. So one would be active and the other would, would be standby in the event that the active should fail. Um, there's also redundant power supplies, which would operate in the same manner. And then we also have, for the line cards, this is on the other side of the chassis if we were to um, go to the other side. There is one line card that we would you can configure as a protect card and you can protect one to one, you can protect a single line card or you can set it up for N plus one which means that it, it is in standby mode and should any of the remaining line cards fail, um, it would all of them or each one of them would 
have the ability to fail over to the protect line card. Uh, what you have to keep in mind is if you have a failover already, so the protect card is in use, protecting another line card, none of the other line cards can fail over anymore because it's already in use. So uh, should it fail over to the protect, you want to go ahead and address the issue with the original working line card. And once that's resolved, go ahead and switch back so that the protect card is available again to protect the rest of the line cards. Another one of the uh, diagrams here, and um, really useful to see which slot numbers they are. Sometimes it's not always easy to, to read it, or if maybe you're not in the data center, um, five zero, you kind of see five zero, and then five one. One thing to note, if you're more familiar with like the routers and switches, um, five zero and five one you might think are kind of on the same module 5 or same line card. However, on the UBR10K CMTS, 5.0 and 5.1 are actually two completely separate line cards. Same with 6.0 and 6.1, 7.0, and 8.0 and 8.1. So um, that is actually a total of eight line cards, although you're going 5.0, 5.1. Uh, we call them sub-slots. So that's a little different there uh, compared to traditional um, Cisco with the routers and switches. UBR10K has, um, I guess, three available processors. Um, mostly what we're seeing in the field now are the PRE2s and PRE4s um, as people upgrade their iOS and use different or the newer line cards, you're almost forced to upgrade to these, otherwise it won't be supported. So similar to the NPE processors on the 7200 series, the PRE manages all layer 2, layer 3, routing and forwarding, um, all the SNMP as and environmental maintenance stats. also has LEDs to alert you of any facility alarms that might be occurring on the box. kind of a closer look at the faceplate. Here you have your LEDs. You have your your standard console and aux ports. Your Ethernet port here for management. You have your slot zero for uh, disk zero for memory. You also have your other additional LEDs here. And we kind of built these slides to be a good reference so you don't have to search through the hundreds of uh, CCO documents online. So um, these will be available after the training and you know, feel free to refer to it and kind of give you a, you know, kind of all in one shot of these diagrams. Okay, moving on to cable line cards. Um, we have the UBR10 5x20. Um, line card, I guess you'd call it a family. Um, you can tell which ones are newer by the number after the 20. So this is a S versus a U and versus an H. And th these are in order in the way that we were de they were deployed. I, we are seeing less and less S cards in the field, less U's, but and predominantly H cards. Uh, these, the naming convention applies to these as well, giving you five downstream and 20 upstream per line card. And again, um, 5 by 20, if we're going with that general guideline of one downstream and four upstreams, that's how we get the uh, 5 by 20. So if you have five available downstreams, four upstreams for each will give you the 20. Um, the 20 by 20 line card, however, um, as you can tell by the name, is 20 downstreams and 20 upstreams. So five downstream ports physically and 20 upstream ports physically. We'll see that in the picture coming up. But um, what, what this is able to do, it gives you the ability to do is add more downstream channels um, per MAC domain. And then finally, we have the 3G60 line card 
which gives you even more port density, 72 downstream and 60 upstream. However, the, this is specific uh, to the MCMTS configuration. So the 72 downstreams are actually coming out of a uh, fiber or copper gigabit connection to an external edge qualm. Here's a picture of the 5x20 card. You'll see the downstream ports are on the bottom, 0 through 4, for a total of 5, and then your upstream ports, 0 through 19, are right above that. And I want to note that the 20x20 20 20 line card uh, faceplate actually looks the same as this with respect to physical ports or connectors. Um, the difference is with each of the downstream ports, 0 through 4, you're, in a sense, creating virtual downstreams to get you to the total of 20 downstreams across five physical interfaces. And um, we'll use the 20 by 20 in one of the configura configuration examples later on. 3G60, um, the physical ports you see here, kind of with the gold connectors, those are all the upstreams. And then the downstreams will be sent out via gigabit um, in these slots here. These are actually empty slots, and you would need to insert a SFP um, to get your proper medium, whether it's copper or fiber, connected. Uh, there's also, um, in the MCMTS configuration, there's also these modules called the Wideband SPA. If you're familiar with the Cisco 7600, these are kind of same concept or same type of cards. The SPAs are inserted into a bigger carrier card called a SIP. And there's one specific wideband SPA for uh, cable technology, and is this module right here. It is also MCMTS. It's just kind of a smaller, um, I guess less downstream availability than the 3G60, but it's also using an SFP uh, to connect to the edge QAM. Uh, you might ask, where, so where are the downstream physical ports? And when you're using a, um, a SPA or a wideband SPA, the, the upstreams, I'm sorry, the upstreams are going to be on an actual line card um, elsewhere in the chassis. So you would actually match those two and say, uh, my downstreams are coming out of the SPA, but the upstreams are going to one of the actual line cards on the UBR10K. Okay, so just kind of want to review before we go on to the um, basic config and the show command. Um, again, in, just like uh, most other kind of communication devices, you need to transmit and receive to establish the two-way communication. In the cable world, we call it downstream and upstream from the perspective of the CMTS. The coax cable, which reaches the cable modem, must be carrying both upstream and downstream frequencies. So, and you're probably familiar with this, either plugging in the coax cable to your, like your cable set-top box or your cable modem. It's just a single cable, and that con contains both upstream and downstream frequencies. A MAC domain consists of at least one downstream and one upstream to establish the two-way communication. And we will see uh, most of these concepts in the configura configuration example coming up. So this is actually, um, I know up here it is a show command, but what is showing is the actual configuration, which is done on the CMTS. And the command that we're highlighting here under the interface, interface cable 800 is the downstream frequency. And you can see here that we've set that to 687 megahertz. This is a, requir this is a required configuration when you're first turning up your CMTS. And in order to check this and make sure the command took you would run the show controller command. And you can see here, um, in addition to all the other stats, I'm just going to highlight the frequency is set there at uh, 687. Um, if you're familiar with some of the pipe commands, you can also pipe down to a certain section of the show controller output, which is actually pretty long. So if 
you know what you're looking for, you can do a pipe, begin, up converter, and that will give us what we're looking for here, downstream frequency, as well as some other good information there. Modulation uh, is another requirement when you're first configuring a cable interface. It's pretty much in the same location here, cable downstream modulation. The choices are 256, QAM, 16, QAM, 64, QAM. And this is where you're going to set that parameter. Again, with the show controller command, um, you'll see it right alongside the frequency, 256 QAM. Right there. Okay, next command we uh, want to discuss here is the no cable downstream RF shutdown. Um, like you heard earlier, I worked with routers and switches before. This is a little bit different because in that, in those devices, it's just shut, no shut under the interface. So uh, it's a little bit more lengthy in, the, in under the cable interface where you have to do no cable downstream RF shutdown. So in, a, in essence, this is a no shut. So if we enter that under the configuration, um, that will like do a shut, no shut on the interface. In this example, we can see that um, the interface is actually shut down at first. RF power disabled. And then the next slide, we'll go ahead and configure it or do a no shut. So go into configuration mode, enter the interface, then enter the command. Um, if you're consoled in or if you have terminal monitor, you should see the syslog messages popping up, letting you know that the up converter changed its state to up. And if we do the same show controller command, you'll see now that the up converter is enabled and it's also providing RF power. It's actually giving you a value versus before it, it just says disabled. The next command is the RF power. Um, based on your plant requirements, um, you can certainly tune this with a configuration command using the cable downstream RF power command, and that value is in dB. You set that here, and again, show controllers will confirm that value for you. So it, the configuration actually was always there from the beginning. We just kind of went through each of the line items uh, separately. So moving on to the upstream, you also are able to set the frequency on the line card. Okay, well, upstream zero frequency, 24 megahertz. You can see that depending on the line card, your valid ranges are 5 to 85 megahertz. If you do the show controller command, you will see the configuration. Uh, does match what we're putting out on the card itself. Channel width, we're going to set it for 3.2 megahertz, and you, you can see that reflected in the show controller output here. And I uh, just kind of want to note here, a lot of these parameters, if you're not familiar with them, um, you know, I really can't go into much details here uh, with the short time frame, but each one are explained in the Cisco documents as well as the Cable Lab uh, DOCSIS specs. If, you wanna, if you're not familiar with them, you want to know, hey, what's the difference between a 3.2 or 6.4 channel width, you can certainly refer to those and kind of get some more information. But here we're just going to show, um, assuming you already know how you want to configure it, this is where you would enter each one of those parameters. And finally, once you do set all of those, um, you'll do a no shut or no cable, a stream zero shutdown. Here's an example again where the upstream is at first, is shut down, 
or here we do see administratively down, similar to routers and switches. We'll enter configuration mode, enter the interface, and then the command, and you'll see these, um, right away you'll see that it changes state to up, and um, if you run the show controller afterwards, you can now compare the two outputs there in green. One says admin down, the other one says upstream zero is up. So if you set up these steps, you should be able to, and you connect the cable modem to your uh, coax cable, this is pretty much what we all want to see is your modem is online. So um, here's some really good commands for checking your cable modems. Show cable modem MAC address. Uh, it will give you the MAC address, the IP, the interface to which it's connected, and the the state. In this case, it's online PT, which is good. It will give you the SID, the receive power, and what this is is the um, the strength of the signal coming from the modem to the CMTS. Basic rule of thumb is you kind of want it to be at zero. In this case, we're at negative 0.5, which is pretty good. Also gives you your timing offset, number of CPEs. This was in our lab here, so we didn't have any CPEs off the back of the cable modem. But um, that's where you would look for that. If you're kind of looking at general health across the whole platform, a good command is show cable modem summary total. And what that does is it shows you per interface how many modems you have total, how many are registered and operating, how many are in off unregistered and offline, how many are running uh, wideband, or how many might be stuck in a ca cable modem init state. So, I, I mean, this, again, this is in our labs. So we have very few modems set up, but if we were to do it on one of our larger customers, you would see, you know, hundreds of modems per interface. And if, say, for example, there was a problem with 710, it would be really easy to spot where you have three-digit numbers going on on the first or the second and third column, whereas 71 all of a sudden has 100 offline instead of in the operating column. Okay, show version. This command um, is the same for all most of Cisco's um, networking devices, and this will give you the iOS image that you're running, how long uh, the CMTS has been up, as well as the last reload reason, um, some other good stuff on the next page here. Uh, tells you what processor you're using. In this case, it's the PRE4 and not the PRE2. Uh, in fact, if you look at the iOS version, when you see here where it says UBR 10K4, that also should match up what PRE you have installed. So if you have a 10K2 iOS image, but you have a PRE4 installed, um, you're, you're going to have some problems there. Um, down here, we have 40 cable modem interfaces across all line cards. Show facility alarms. These are the type of alarms that um, are reported as like major, minor, or critical, such as maybe a fan tray failure, um, overheating. In these cases, uh, you have an example here. SFP is missing. So maybe that SFP is configured, but it, it either died or it was physically pulled out. You're going to get a critical alarm for that. Um, these ones are just informational physical port admin down. So. These are also, if you have an NMS device or SNMP monitoring, these are, um, you can query for these as well using that. Show inventory is a real easy um, snapshot of what is installed on your device. Uh, we can tell the platform, the processor, here we have one of the wideband spas that we looked at earlier. We have a 5x20U card in slot 5.1 and 20x20 20 20 cards in slots 6.0 and 7.0. 
and also uh, 3G60 in slot 7-1. You'll also notice that it provides serial numbers at the end, so those are useful should you need to open a case um, or maybe have an RMA, this is where you would find the serial number if you don't happen to be in front of the line card itself. Okay, so next section we're going to go through a configuration of DOCSIS 3 channel bonding, uh, specifically downstream channel bonding. And we want to kind of review really quick. We need to know the concept because we are doing channel bonds, bonding. We need to review the concept of ICMTS versus MCMTS. So take a look at this diagram. I think we have a polling question coming up. Is that right, Dan? Yep, it should be coming up right now. Okay. Let's have a look at our second polling question. Which diagram from the previous slide depicts an ICMTS configuration? Is it A, top, B, bottom? Let's have another look at that diagram. Okay, take a moment to answer, and we'll have a look at the results in just a minute. Okay. So, again, uh, just for review, I means integrated, and M means modular. So, you would kind of think of integrated, it's kind of um, all, more of like an all-in-one, everything is in the device, versus modular, you might have multiple devices. Um, still going, so let's let's kind of talk about DOCSIS 3 briefly. Uh, it's kind of a huge topic, but just um, what what kind of features does DOCSIS 3 give us? Um, I guess some of them, well, they're all pretty, pretty important, but one of the ones you kind of hear about more are, are the ability to have increased throughput or bandwidth through the use of upstream channel bonding and downstream ch channel bonding. And what that means is, um, I guess we can look at this diagram here. If you have multiple downstream channels, we can virtually bond them together to make a single downstream channel that consists of three, or in this case, three um, RF channels. So instead of just having one RF channel's worth of bandwidth, we can now bond three of them together and give you the aggregate. Um, it's also possible to that to do that in the upstream direction. So, with the introduction of, um, I guess, more bandwidth-intensive applications or um, content on the web or from your video service provider, um, this is really what uh, a lot of folks have been waiting for in the DOCSIS world. Um, other features include IPv6 support in DOCSIS 3. It also has enhanced multicast support and has an enhanced security. So looking at the uh, polling question, it looks like um, most people got that one. The top one is the ICMTS or integrated CMTS config uh, because you can see that both the downstream, these three here, and the upstream channels are terminating on the 20 by 20 line card versus the bottom diagram where the downstream is actually going through a gigabit, in this case, actually going to a switch. So it looks like their edge qualm is not even close, physically close to the UBR10K. It might be in a different row. Or, so they send the gigabit traffic containing your, containing your DEPI sessions to the external edge qualm, which then converts those DEPI sessions into the RF, which is needed to terminate on the wideband cable modem. So there's a difference there. The modular, again, you're having external equipment to handle one aspect of the whole downstream, upstream needed to bring your cable modem online. Okay. So 
another quick overview um, of the features I was talking about. Um, transmit and receive across multiple channels. That is called channel bonding. And um, I want to keep these five components uh, in mind when we go through the configuration. Uh, it seems like a lot, but they all um, have their own piece into getting a cable modem wideband online. So in this example, it's only we're only going to be doing downstream channel bonding. But in the upstream channel bonding, you could, it's, it's, for the most part, it is the same. Some of the terms might change, but there are um, multiple parts needed before you can get a modem upstream channel bonded. So. With that, we'll take a look at number one, which is the controller. The controller kind of signifies or is closest to the physical aspect of the, um, of the line card or in the config. So in the controller integrated cable 700, there you'll see the integrated keyword that lets you know we're doing ICMTS. Um, in this case, we're actually doing it off of a 20 by 20 line card. So. That is integrated cable. You'll set your RF channels here, and you can set your frequency, NXB for US versus uh, Europe or other parts of the world, your modulation, and your interleave. Uh, one thing to note here, so this is kind of the same as the, the previous 5x20 card example. It's just under a different section, which is the controller. One thing to note here in this little bubble chat window is that you sh the best practice is just retain these numbers here. Um, with the five components, it, it does get a little bit confusing sometimes already. So if you start modifying these on your own, it, it might just add to possibility of mismatching channel IDs or whatnot. If you do the show controller integrated cable command, you'll see your RF channels, which are configured, zero, one, two, and three. And in this case, we can actually see MPEG traffic is um, going over that RF channel. If you saw, uh, so this is a good command. If, for example, you saw a lot of all zeros or maybe like a 0 0.1 or something, um, that could indicate an issue um, at the controller level. Okay, number two, second component on that list is the actual cable interface. Uh, this is where we do a couple of things. The first one is we're defining the primary channels up above using downstream integrated cable, 700, RF channel 0 through 3, upstream 0 to 3. So this is, I guess, where we're kind of bonding it. The previous config was integrated cable 700. Now we're matching that up with interface cable 700 through this configuration command. Um, under the interface is where you would do all the upstream configurations as well, and this hasn't changed from our first example, where you have your frequency, channel width, um, DOCSIS mode, uh, etc. Um, here's a useful command here that, uh, that really helps to understand how you've configured um, matching up all those five components. In this case, we're just going to be looking at two, but or we've only looked at two, but the show cable MAC domain, cable 700, CGD associations. You'll see your host here is 70, and the available downstream channels are 0 through 3. These are the RF channels we configured in the previous slide. It also tells you which upstreams you have configured, 0 to 3, and which ones are active. next part is called integrated cable. So what we're doing here is we're defining, we're actually allocating bandwidth to those interfaces or controllers that we've assigned in the two or configured in the previous two slides. Um, so in this case, let's look at uh, first the notation here, integrated cable 700 colon zero. Uh, the number after that colon is your RF channel. So 0, 1, 2, 3, that brings us back to the first slide. I'm sorry to keep bouncing back and forth, but I think it's good to see it. Um, 
RF channel 0, 1, 2, 3. So that's what we're doing here. Um, and in this case, we're assigning bandwidth as the, in the primary channel. And so out of the total RF bandwidth of RF channel 0, how much of that do we want to be to make available um, to make it a primary capable channel. And what that means, primary is where you're going to send all your station maintenance messages or MAC messages for just DOCSIS communication. Um, some people kind of consider it more of an overhead, but it's, it's definitely required. And um, in this case, we've assigned 50% of that RF channel can be used as a primary. Uh, I guess another thing you could consider for the primary channel is, in this case, we're doing wideband modems. If, for example, there's a narrowband modem out there in the field, those have to go across a primary channel. So definitely need to define one with some bandwidth allocated. The default in this case is zero, as you can see here. And the last thing you want to configure here is cable bundle one. So this is, in, um, actually, it's not configurable. It is inherited from the uh, previous config. So you can't change this cable bundle one. If you look at the show command, show controller integrated cable 700 mapping RF channel. This is where we kind of con confirm what was configured above. So 700 RF channel 0, 1, 2, and 3. You have your bandwidth allocated at 50% and that matches each one of those above. You see the wideband channel. Uh, these ones actually we'll see in the next slide, but it's using the same command to check those. So here we go, wideband. So this is um, when we were talking about bundling the physical RFs into more of a virtual interface. That's what we're talking about here with the wideband component. So wideband is going to take cable bundle one, any of the previous um, RFs that were defined as cable bundle one, we're going to allocate bandwidth. In this case, because you definitely need um, bandwidth in this section, the default is actually 100%. So, and that's a good place to start if for some reason you want to throw that back down for, um, for different applications, you can do that. But if you don't configure the bandwidth percent, it will allocate 100% here. Here's a good command to check that, show controller integrated cable mapping wideband channel. You can see that 46 is allocated here. And then this is the same command that we looked at earlier, where you have 50% allocated to the RFs, and then the wideband has 46, which matches the configurations up above here. So. These actually, um, if we look at this command here, the 50 and the 46 for 700 RF channel 0, um, that, that's pretty much maxed out. These need to add up to 96% total. So if we went to 40 here, this could be bumped up to 56. Or if we went to 10, then this, if we went to 10 here, this one could be bumped up to 86. And you, you would get an error message if you tried to allocate more bandwidth than what was um, available. The last piece um, is the fiber node. And th this is, uh, I guess they're all important, but this one is going to define your physical, I guess how your plant, physical plant topology, it's going to define it for the CMTS because the CMTS really doesn't know how things are physically wired. So if we manually configure it and it's accurate, it kind of makes your CMTS aware of how the MAC domain is set up, and um, it, you know that just will help in the two-way communication. I've seen cases where this was not configured and it still worked, but that's definitely not uh, that is a one-off. It you need to configure this to make the CMTS know how things are connected. So here, we're, here in this case, we're going to define cable fiber node one. Um, so what is in the fiber node? 
the fiber node includes downstream integrated cable 700, RF channels 0 through 3, as well as upstream cable 70 connectors 0 to 3. If we do the show cable fiber node command, we'll see that fiber node uh, confirms your downstreams and upstreams here. And what you really want to see is MDD status valid. If it gives you an invalid there, then we need to go through all the command or all the configuration and just make sure things are um, configured correctly. See, we've seen these two commands before. Um, let's see. And um, just kind of want to note that there's definitely a lot of commands, and um, but we we do use all of them to kind of check back and forth, hey, is the fiber node matching up with the wideband, or does your interface match up with the integrated cable configuration? Um, so, yeah, you're going to see some of the same information on a lot of the commands, but it, it's always good to check and just make sure a lot of the issues we do see are misconfiguration. So, um, that's We'll run all those commands and go through it carefully just to make sure we're not stuck there before, you know, doing any advanced troubleshooting. Here's an example of a fiber node giving you an invalid state. So in the interface wideband cable, we actually configured cable bundle 99. Um, in the interface cable, which is using these um, RF channels defined above, we have we configured cable bundle one. Uh, leaving the fiber node configuration the same on the previous slide, we just ran the command again. And you'll see here MDD status invalid, bundle ID inconsistent. Um, there you go, right there. Okay, uh, another good thing to check. Um, Say, for example, you have a cable modem, but it's not coming up wideband online. One of the first checks we'll do is we'll look for the MDDs to be incrementing. And what MDDs is is a MAC domain descriptor. And it basically communication with the cable modem to tell the cable modem, hey, we were able to do wideband. Um, here are some of the parameters. And we'll wait for a response from the cable modem. So command is show controllers cable 700 and again it's a very long command so I, I did a pipe begin downstream channel ID so that will take us here and what we're looking for is actually just below that in the MDDs and the, this is a counter value um, so here it's currently 9 I run the same command again and it's at 23 so this is a good sign that the CMTS is sending out the MDDs to the cable modem. Here, uh, we're going to introduce some debugs. You can debug. The, first, you have to specify the cable interface that you want to debug using this command um, with a verbose option. That will limit the debugs to just that interface. So that's, that's a good thing. It's going to cut down on some of the debug information, and it will also be less, um, I guess, less demanding on your processor if you were to de versus debugging every interface on the CMTS. So just kind of, I just cut out the important parts of the debug. So actually in green, you'll see channel ID 97. And you can see that here on the previous show controller, there's a 97 there. So that's a good sign that we're looking at the right RF channels. Frequency is 681. Primary capable, yes or no. That's, uh, that's a good thing to look at. And then here in your MAC domain descriptor, MDDs, we actually see what's in there. And it lists out each of the channel IDs that are available for this downstream bonding. And that's 97, 98, 99, and 100. Matches up exactly here on the uh, command to the left. And also lists your frequencies, which we don't see here but you can match it up in the uh, show run or your configuration. Okay, so 
basic ranging and registration. Hopefully some of you have done some debugs before. Um, if not, um, we just kind of, it might seem a little bit confusing at first, but really um, if you kind of just go through them, you can, you can see some really good information about what's going on um, with respect to what debugs you have turned on. So in this case, kind of turned on all of these. The first one is debug cable MAC address and then the MAC of the cable modem verbose. Um, this again limits the debug output to just this cable modem that you specified here via MAC address. So that's really good. If you have thousands of modems, you, de you don't want to debug everything. Um, debug cable MDD for MAC domain descriptor. We have debug cable ranging, registration, TLV, DHCP, and cable service DS selection or downstream selection. Um, so in this case, I, I, I bounce the modem. With the debugs turned on, same config, I bounce the modem. And you'll see here that the CMTS got a bonding initial ranging request from this cable modem. So that's a good sign. If you're going to do any um, channel bonding, you need to see a bonding initial ranging request. So maybe the modem is online, but it's not wideband online. Um, it could be that this is missing, and the debugs can confirm that. Mm. Kind of moving on down the initial ranging, you'll see that it gives you a downstream channel ID, a SID, uh, gives you the timing, power, and frequency. If any adjustments are needed, those will continue. And then here highlighted, we have a, we're sending, so we see send, it's from the CMTS to the modem, send a ranging response to this MAC address um, with these parameters, and then hopefully you see ranging successful. This is a, uh, this diagram is a good diagram that shows that kind of handshake between the CMTS and the DOCSIS 3 wideband cable modem, which is, is what we're talking about WCM is wideband cable modem. So if, say, for example, you first turn on the modem, you're going to get a sync message, and you see the MAP messages sent from the CMTS to the wideband modem. And that should be, when you turn it on, it's going to be looking out on the wire to lock on a downstream. So it, it should get these messages. And if so, um, there we go. You, we're going to include the MDD messages. That was what we were checking for earlier, um, from the C, again, from the CMTS to the DOCSIS 3 cable modem. And once the modem locks on, get, it sees the MDD message, it's going to go ahead and reply with a B bonding initial ranging request. So. At this point, CMTS and the cable modem are kind of on the same page with respect to we're going to do some channel bonding. Uh, these here are, uh, I guess we, we omitted some of the initial ranging sequence um, of the handshake. And then we'll have the DHCP part of the handshake here. Uh, and, and finally, we'll kind of skip those and go to these registration request MP message from the cable modem to the CMTS and um, a response back from the CMTS to the cable modem. I actually had these debugs as well, but I think I missed them on a slide. So if you are going through the debugs, you want to see these messages here. Um, what those include are the receive channel configs, what are available, what you can use, and the modem will reply. Or then the CMTS say, go ahead and use, you know, three channels and bond, bond them. Okay. Finally, this is kind of what everyone wants to see: is your modem is W online. So if we do a show cable modem wideband command, we'll see the MAC address, the IP address assigned, interface. And then it's W online or wideband online. And you also see the primary SID, RCCID, and your MAC 
MDDFSG equals one or your downstream service group. Yes, sir. If you want to look at the primary channel wideband, it will show you that the primary channel that it selected for this modem is 700 colon 1. Remember we made all those RF channels primary capable by adding the bandwidth. So in the other modems that were wideband online, you could see you don't always have to change, choose the same primary downstream. In this case, it selected RF channel 0, and in this one, it selected RF channel 2. Okay, this is also a good command here. Show cable modem MAC address wideband RCS status. This will show you each one of the um, bonded channels that the modem has locked up to. And um, one thing to note, it's not so obvious at first, is we'll see here three RF channels, RF channel 700 colon 0, RF 700 colon 2, and RF 700 colon 3. Uh, but actually, that modem is bonding across all four channels. And the reason why you only see three of them listed here is it does not list the primary channel. So um, kind of if you see three channels here, add one, you're bonding with four channels. So 0, 2, and 3 are listed here. But if we go to the primary command before, you'll see that it's on 700 colon 1, which is the missing RF channel, and for a total of four. Uh, here's a show cable modem verbose command and just gives you um, very detailed information about that cable modem specifically. Giving you primary downstream, wideband capable, yes. Multiple transmit channel mode, no. Uh, transmit channel from the cable modem perspective is upstream. So is are we doing upstream bonding? No. In the Mac version, this is a 3.0 modem. So uh, that, that's pretty much it for the uh, the examples. Like I said, if we take a look at the uh, these will be these slides are available for you after um, today's webcast, and they're kind of developed to be a really good reference um, for anyone working on a CMTS. In the green boxes, I didn't talk about it earlier, but those are some relevant commands to kind of show you maybe the same information, maybe a little bit more information about the topic that we're discussing. That's pretty much it. Uh, I know there's probably some questions coming in throughout the presentation. And Dan, do we have a polling question number three? Yeah, let's get to this last one. What cable topics would you like to learn more about in the future? A, packet cable. B, basic CMTS configuration and troubleshooting. C, DOCSIS set-top gateways. D, DOCSIS load balancing. Or E, DOCSIS 3.0. Please let us know so we can plan for our future webcasts. Okay. And just to note, I think you will get a survey. You can also do a free form um, suggestion in there for any future topics. That's right. Okay, if anyone still has questions, please do uh, submit them. We have a few minutes left to, uh, to go through our audience questions. Um, so we're going to get to that in a second. Um, as you can see here, we also have some references for everyone. Um, this slide, of course, will be part of the uh, the PDF, so you can you can reference this later. But a lot of good information right here. Okay, let's uh, let's get to our first question. Uh, can you please comment on IPv6 hardware acceleration support on the Cisco 7225 and the 7246? Okay, Dan. Um, yeah, I think we're going to take that. We're going to probably have to take that one offline. Um, it's kind of a detailed, or I guess it's 
more kind of a design issue, so we don't want to kind of take that in this in the scope of this training. So um, definitely contact me, or if you can post that up on the on the support community, we'll be glad to answer that one. Okay, that sounds fine. If you've ever posted that, please do double check back in the Cisco support community forum, and Eric can follow up with you on that with a more extended answer. Okay. Okay, now we're going to look at the, the next question. Um, the question about a few products going end of service. Uh, is it true that the MC16U and the MC28U are going end of service? Is that true? Um, yeah, I will have to double check that. Uh, a lot of times, while they are end of sale, they might not be end of support. So um, being in the TAC, we actually go, um, although they're not being deployed anymore in the field or sold, or even are made, we would still take questions on them. So um, 28U, I think, is still more readily available, but the 16U, there's a good chance you're not going to be able to order those anymore, not from Cisco at least. Okay, let's get to another question here. Um, what customer level would make one go, hey, it's time to upgrade that 10K now uh, when looking at the network? Well, I mean, I really, I mean, there's definitely a lot of variables for that, Dan. Um, it could be maybe there's a lot of your modems or the overall count of modems are growing, not able to be supported on the the port density that's on a 7246 even. So if you need more space, definitely you need to upgrade. If you find that your your um, your bandwidth requirements are higher, uh, definitely upgrade. If you, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of variables. So basically, it is utilization, and um, I don't necessarily think a feature would make you upgrade because when you go to the 7246 or even the 7225, all the features usually um, will work across platforms. So it's more of a capacity thing. Okay. Uh, okay, let's go to our next question. Uh, for the 3G60 line cards, what is the role of the SPA 5X1 Gig E version 2? Okay. Uh, I'd say those two are not really related. The 3G60 line card for just bringing cable modems up, um, it can operate on its own without a SPA 5x1 gig E. Um, that SPA is normally just for gigabit traffic, more towards the IP backbone of the um, provider. Um, now, if we're talking about the wideband SPA, um, that wideband SPA can, it kind of, Performs the similar functions of a 3G60. Previously, they didn't, they weren't able to work together. But I believe in the newest software, we are now able to, um, for them to coexist or to work together in a, for example, a wideband configuration. So that's the wideband SPA, uh, different from the SPA which was mentioned in the question that you gave. Okay, let's go to another question. Uh, looks like a question on some sh uh, shutdown commands. Um, does the RF-shutdown command uh, replace the shutdown command? Uh, for example, not needing the no shutdown command on the, on the interface for the cable. Uh, okay. Um. There is a no shut, I believe, under interface cable, maybe on the older interfaces, but I'll have to kind of double check which ones do have no shut. But, it, you know, if if there's no no shutdown available, you definitely need the no cable RF shutdown command. That's going to turn on the physical RF um, to put it on the wire. So. Okay. Another question here. What are the main benefits of uh, DOCSIS 2 versus DOCSIS 3? 
Okay, so DOCSIS 3 again um, introduces the upstream and downstream channel bonding. Um, IP version 6 support in DOCSIS 3 but not in DOCSIS 2. Um, DOCSIS 3 has an enhanced security and also enhanced multicast support. So kind of keeping you more, uh, getting you prepared for transmitting the video as opposed to data. Okay, let's go to another question. Uh, I noticed the N plus one line card redundancy was mentioned without mentioning an RF switch. Is it possible to set up line card redundancy without an RF switch? Okay, no, that, that is a good question. Um, RF switch is needed, um, definitely for the upstream. In the downstream direction, if you're doing modular CMTS, then there is no RF switch needed in that direction. Um, redundancy in the downstream direction would be provided via redundant gigabit ports. But yeah, no, definitely you need an RF switch to switch the uh, physical connection between working and protect line cards. Okay, next question. What are the uh, SPA and SIP modules? Uh, where do they fit on the CMTS and why would one use them in terms of benefits? Okay, um, the SIP module is a carrier card into which you can insert four SPAs. Um, these are located on the bottom right of the CMTS. Can I scroll back to some slides, Dan, at this time? Or? Oh, please, go ahead. Okay. Let me see if I could uh, pull that up here. So, yeah. Um, here, this might be an old diagram where these are old gigabit cards. Let me see if I can find a, with a SIP. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a diagram with a SIP, but they would be going in these this section here. So you would have a SIP into which you can insert various SPA cards, and those SPA cards would include the wideband SPA, which you would use for DOCSIS 3, or just your basic gigabit card for backbone connectivity, such as the 5x1 that, uh, that was asked about earlier. So those would go here. If you're familiar with the 7600 platform, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. They just Now they're able to be used on the UBR10K platform. Okay, that's actually going to do it for our Q&A portion of today's event as we're running low on time. So let's get to our trivia question. Uh, what cable or video milestone is celebrating its 10th anniversary at Cisco? Uh, is it A, Cisco Systems announced its first cable modem for small office, home office, and telecommuting environments? Is it B, winner of the Pioneer Technology Award for Data over Cable Systems Interface Specification? Or C, Cisco ships, ships its 250,000 upstream cable modem termination system port? Take a moment to answer and see if you get this one right. And in the meantime, I just want to let everyone know that uh, we do appreciate your feedback, uh, so please do fill out the survey upon the close of the WebEx. Um, we will be selecting one person who, who does fill out the survey to win a $50 Amazon gift card. So, do, so please do fill out those surveys. If you have any additional questions or your question didn't get answered today, we invite you to join the uh, Cisco support community. Eric will, will be participating um, from today until September 21st. Um, we will also be posting the chat, the, uh, all the interactions as well as the on-demand video and the PDF uh, will be posted there as well. Um, so please do check back. The link is here or you can just go straight to the Cisco Support Forums page um, and navigate there. A few other housekeeping slides for some upcoming webcasts. We have a webcast in Polish uh, coming up how to troubleshoot Cisco iOS software that will be taking place on September 18th. We have our Japanese webcast. Topic will be Nexus 7000 General Architecture and Troubleshooting on September 24th.
And in October, we have another English speaking webcast, Understanding and Troubleshooting ASA NAT. That will be on October 2nd. Another English webcast coming up, Cisco Unified Call Manager version 9 on October 9th. And again on October 30th, troubleshooting SSL VPN on ASA. Uh, right now we do have a number of Ask the Expert events taking place uh, within the support community forum over, uh, across a number of topics, so please do check back to see if any of those interest you, and please do participate. Again, we are a global community, and we do have uh, webcasts in many different languages, Spanish, Portuguese, Japanese, Polish, or Russian. Um, you can join all of those specific communities and participate in your own language. We also invite you to participate in all of our social activities, uh, everything from Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google+, LinkedIn, uh, just about any forum we are participating. So please do check us out and please do follow us. And here's a quick answer to our trivia question. As you can see, number A, uh, Cisco achieved this in 19, September of 1998. B, Cisco achieved, achieved this in 1999. And then it looks like our answer, uh, Cisco ach achieved its 250,000th upstream cable modem termination system port in two, back in 2002, so 10th anniversary for that. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone, especially Eric, our expert today, for his presentation. Great job. And of course, we want to thank you, our participants, for, t for joining us today and, uh, and participating in our webcast. We hope to see you at another event very soon. Have a great day. <laughs>